Hello there everybody, it's Subana to Akenheimer, and welcome back to, to Tokyo Babble. I'm just going to point this out, I feel halfway dead. But, I'm not going to cut this video short. So let's jump right in. And so the day following the Banquet of Madness. Uh, yeah. Sormi was kneeling in front of me. Didn't feel right to stand in such a situation, so I kneeled as well, leveling our eyes. あの、なんかいろいろとごめんなさい。いや、その、えっと、酔った勢いっていうのは多分あるんだけど、酔ってなかったらしないってわけでもなくて。え、don't worry about it. 嘘をつけなかったというかね。えっと、あの、その、えっと、お互いに酔っていた。そう。Yeah, I doubt this would go very well in real life, I think. My memories of yesterday were blurry and vague, as if they were merely remnants of a dream. I could remember what we, we exchanged a kiss, but I could not for the life of me recall what led us to it. All I knew is that I had the time of my life. There was no denying that fact. Well, I suppose that settled that. Now all I wished was for her to raise her head. She suddenly raised her face and lurched towards me. Well, in all honesty, I still, I personally still prefer Raziel, but... I wasn't sure why she brought those two up, but... Sorry, Flushing bright red, returned to her kneeling posture. I asked her to look up, but she covered her face instead and shook her head. I couldn't get her to raise her face in the end. Meanwhile, countless demons and angels lay dead on the cold floor of the banquet hall, or gym. The group of Dentalians seemed to have toppled over in the middle of a snake dance. Belial was lying unconscious, seemingly terrified of what he had seen in a hand mirror he still clutched tightly. Things didn't look too good. Raziel seemed to be frozen in time in a sitting position, her eyes as expressionless as those of a dead fish. Things didn't look too good. Camiel, who was supposed to keep things in check, lay slumped in the corner with three bottles still in his mouth. We're in serious trouble here. Th th three bottles of what? <laughs> Lilith, who lied closest to my feet, waved me to come closer. <laughs> this is what drinking does to you, kids. A tirade of convulsive seizures seemed to have assaulted her, but I was sure she was going to be alright. After all, she was our Lilith. It didn't seem like we'd venture to the third stratum today. Oh well. Okay, that's fucking disturbing. I never thought of loneliness as torment, but I certainly thought so of pain, and I knew it to be true. The whole world belonged to me. I ruminated on the idea. Laughable. I should have laughed it off. Obey my orders with not a thought for yourselves. Oh, and we will. Oh, and we won't think. You could carve indignity into my flesh. You could hurt both my body and soul. But that was the extent of your powers, wasn't it? Wait and see. Wait and see, I tell you. One day, one day I shall turn this world upside down. Turn over. I shall squish your world like I do the yolk by flipping a frying egg. 
Let me sing my raison d'être of hatred to the world, for hatred is the sole ruler of my heart. The simplest of motives, the simplest of reasons, and yet it was everything to me. Yes, that was how it was supposed to be. Wasn't revenge and hatred the only things that let me move forward? Yet I felt as if I was losing track of them as of late. An accursed thorn had dug into my heart, one that I could have probably pried out had I only tried. Yet I couldn't bring myself to. It was a small, minuscule thorn that had made me vaguely recall part of my old self. I couldn't bring myself to pry it out. Ah, I supposed it was the reason for my madness. It was the reason why my heart fell apart without the need of coarse whispers in my ears. But I shan't turn back. I shan't consider the notion. I mean, how could I? For this world has already met its end. Hmm. Oh! We going to Uriel? <laughs> he was at his heels. No matter how fast he ran, no matter how fast he flew, the pursuer was at his heels, always matching his speed perfectly. He didn't try to catch him, but nor would he let him get away. There was but one meaning behind this exercise, applying pressure. A faint smile seemed to run across the lips of the angel. Uriel, the divine flame itself that oversaw the gates of hell, was now but a lowly fugitive. <laughs> I swear I've heard that voice! <laughs> Uriel stopped running. His heart, almost bursting from terror, continued to pump ether through his veins. The two landed down on the ground and faced each other. It was only then that Uriel could finally remember the name of the one he faced with clarity. The man seemed as if he had been formed from metal and ice. Crystal arms, steel torso, silver legs. Oh. His artificial looking frame resembled neither angels nor demons, nor humans, nor anything living for that matter. Hmm. Maybe it's Metatron. Or Enoch. The angel shook his head in response to Uriel's feral outburst. So we still have no idea what caused God to, like, succumb to madness. Either we'll learn that in this route, probably, or maybe it'll be in Lilith's route. I don't know, but I'm very curious what caused God to, you know, fucking lose his shit. The man shrugged. また像を抜き出しにしたね。今の君は理性的に見えて全くそうでもない。君はこの世界全てを罰したがって、お見事に壊れっぷりだ。黙れ、黙れ、黙れ、黙れ、黙れ、黙れ、黙れ。黙らせ
所詮かつてあった未来を知り未来を司り未来を滑る私にとって取るに足らない願望で The angel readied his own weapon. It seemed like a short wand to Uriel at first, but he soon realized his eyes had momentarily fooled him. A twinkling silver light, hell bent on obliterating all matter that it came in contact with, shot out both ends of the wand. Black particles flickered around it, eventually merging with the white beam. The result, a black thread running along the white blade. It seemed like a double bladed sword at first glance, but its blades were far too long. One would have to stretch the limits of language to call that thing a sword at this point. It was a weapon of pure condensed annihilation. A thousand would die seeing it drawn, ten thousand would follow after its single swing. It was a wicked tool that would permit such mad causation. Hmm. Harbinger of Ash. Huh. Must be from Dark Souls. Huh. 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 Rage exploded in Uriel's heart, sweeping his fear away. He launched at the insolent angel. The bolt in his hand was a close quarters weapon. Steel clashed against the silver light. Despite the clear difference in weight, the two weapons entered into a deadlock, the sheer strength of their swings seemingly equal. Uriel tried using feints and agility to put the angel off balance. His opponent, however, readied his weapon and took a single swing in response. The next moment, everything around Uriel, buildings, roads, the space itself turned to ash. Not giving his obliterated surroundings a look, Uriel glared at the angel. Yeesh. Dismissing Uriel's curses without batting an eye, the angel delivered his testimony strong and steadfast. <laughs> Following the merciless declaration, the angel shoved the tip of his thick blade into Uriel's chest. Seabills? The man's arms froze. Seabills' prophecy? Sybil's prophecy. Whoa! The bolt in Uriel's hand suddenly shattered to pieces, becoming something akin to a fragmentation grenade. Its metal fragments flew towards and dug into the flesh of the angel. Without a moment of faltering, Uriel fled. He ran, he flew, he did anything to escape. From the sixth stratum towards the fifth, from the fifth to the fourth, from the fourth to the third, he fled in desperation, plummeting like a falling meteor. Shame. Anguish. Desperation. Grasping at the non-existent hope, he ran from certain death in the same fashion one runs from reality. And at the end of his road, he finally found them. He spotted those eyes that could see through the devil himself. She was there, there was no mistaking it. That woman was among them. 
the one he had to erase no matter what. Reaffirming his holy mission, Uriel vaulted towards the group with carnage on his mind. They say two is a company, three is a crowd. And I would have still been perfectly fine with four. Both Razia saw me and myself, unfortunately. <laughs> you have Adam and Eve with us? <laughs> oh, come on, there's nothing wrong with this. See, Eve's thinking the right thing. Indeed, the unsettling whispers of angels would only reach us if we let our guards down. It had yet to become, it had yet to become a serious issue. They'd snicker, they'd promise us happiness, they'd pray for us. Callous voices merge into one divine chant that, upon traversing our ear canals, canals would try to take root inside our minds. All whispered a single phrase, Abandon thought. Curse potent enough to revert men back into beasts. A very pleasant, liberating temptation that filled my heart with naught but contempt. Smart. Wolf let out a sigh. Yeah. Adam suddenly called out to me. <laughs> His dismissal was so abrupt I couldn't help cocking my head. I took a deep breath. I was all right. My mind was as calm as a lake. Calm as a lake. But then won't I? But wait a minute. It was against the battle. It was, it was the battle with Uriel that led to him discovering his race on Dare. So... With that, Adam flew into the air, E following right after him. All I could do was awkwardly see them off. Sorami gave me a hearty smile and was about to step forward as both Lilith and Raziel grasped her respective shoulders. They probably want to take you away to have some girl talk. What? Lilith and Razio responded in perfect unison. They proceeded to give each other a high five and everything, but I decided against making a comment. It was most likely Hinoe Wataru, a boy who had devoured the archdemon Aunz, the astrologer of flames, that currently ruled over the third stratum. And as Adam had insisted, it was his turn to challenge the master of the stratum first. It seemed Cameo and the others wanted to test him in a real battle scenario to make sure there were no problems with his current design. It was angels, not God, who made this Adam after all, so no one could really tell if he was a perfect creation or not, or if he had what it took to become a hero for mankind. Adam himself didn't seem to doubt his capabilities or fate, though, and had fully embraced his role. With Sormi's hand in mine, I soared through the sky. It was probably a good idea to head for Tokyo Dome first, uh, but I was a bit worried its raging flames might be a bit too much for Sormi to handle. <laughs> I'm not 
自分の内側からエネルギーが溢れ出てる感じああナノマシンか I almost forgot I injected her with some They were probably regulating her temperature out of their own volition Well, I doubted they would cause her any harm So I guess leaving them alone was the best course of action for now We were soaring through the sky at our own pace When Sormi suddenly let out a confused cry Oh I directed my gaze towards the flame she pointed at Blazing ferociously moments before They seemed to lose their vigor And turned to simmering embers in hardly a blink of an eye Shit, that was quick. The disappearance of flames meant that the Master had lost dominion over the stratum. Or in other words, it was no longer among the living. Probably. <laughs> you know what? That was probably it. It would be just like him to ignore the common courtesy and... Though, now that I thought about it, that was how real battles should be fought, shouldn't they? We reached Tokyo Dome. Luckily, the flames had destroyed the bigger half of the structure's roof so we could land directly on the baseball field within it. Oh. We found Adam and Eve lingering there aloof. Adam. He glanced at me and cocked his head to the side. Wait, what? Wait. <laughs> Probably Uriel. Just as Eve said that, Lilith and Raziel dropped down from the sky, both of them wore perplexed expressions. この階層の支配者は死んでいるだがこの場にいる誰も支配者を倒したわけではないミステリーミステリーね実にミステリーだわ。ミステリー? Everyone directed their gaze towards where Raziel pointed her finger. Some sort of an object seemed to have been falling down from the sky, the sight of which made Sormi let out a small cry. I couldn't watch him hit the ground and die like this. I jumped into the air and caught the human shape in my arms. But I soon realized I was wasting my efforts. The clothes which I thought brown at first seemed to have only taken on that color after being charred to ash. Two deep holes gave from where the body's... The body's eyes were supposed to be. They were likely incinerated by extremely potent flames. Jesus! Did Hinoe Wataru do this? Everyone came to inspect my find as I landed on the ground. I covered the body from her sight, but she just let out an apologetic laugh. So she saw it already. All others here were used to the carnage of the battlefield, but I wished I could at least spare her from the sight. <laughs> Regarding Sormi at the corner of my eyes, I proceeded to inspect the body. I checked the pockets of the half-burned jeans and found the remains of some sort of a pouch. It probably used to be his wallet. I carefully unfolded the leather remains that still felt hot to the touch and checked if there was anything telling of its master's identity inside. I found a half-melted card. I pulled it out and glanced at its name panel. I barely made them out, but the letters on it spelled Noe Wataru. Everyone fell silent. As soon as we solved one mystery, another one arose. If he was Hinoe Wataru, then the reason why the flame so abruptly disappeared was indeed clear as day. With its master dead, the third stratum should return to its usual state. That was normal. The problem was... Adam voiced the thoughts that everyone had in their minds, and he didn't just die. He was the one who consumed Ounce, the demon of flames, yet he'd been burned to death. 
A fish drowning would have made more sense. Lilith and Raziel exchanged glances, tension nestling on their faces. As if responding to Eve's question, Sormi suddenly shuddered and directed her eyes up into the sky. No one had time to react to her cry. Something akin to a missile suddenly whooshed across the sky and stared at us with overflowing ma and started at us with overflowing mouths. Uriel, that Uriel, the overseer of hell, administrator of divine punishment, the living incarnation of God's anger. A member of the highest cast of angels, the Seraphs, and one of the four master angels. At the same time, I was hit by a revelation. The ne meaning of the name Uriel was Flame of God. Mere mortal flames could not possibly equal him. Howling like a mad dog, Uriel readied the steel bolt in his hands, the bolt used to seal the gates of hell. The steel bolt exploded into countless pieces of shrapnel. Without a moment of thought, I tackled Sormi in hopes of putting her out of harm's way. Each of the steel fragments that went after us was like a tiny nuclear warhead. They'd explode as soon as they hit the ground, devastating everything in their surrounding area. With Sora me in my arms, I was about to look for an escape route when Adam caught my eyes. Adam was the only one standing. Covering Eve behind his back, he caught the steel shrapnel bomb flying at him with his bare hands. The steel shrapnel scorching the skin of his palm did not phase him at all. He threw it back at Uriel, using it as a projectile. <laughs> Unable to dodge it perfectly, the Master Angel was left with a deep cut running across his cheek. E pulled a lance out of a pocket dimension in one wide motion. As soon as its snow-white glimmer caught Uriel's eyes, he jumped away, letting out an air-piercing shriek. The tip of the long weapon in pure white was soaked in saint's blood. It reached up to two, maybe three meters in length. Gracing the world at the same time as the Holy Grail and witness to the death of a great saint, it was told to grant the hegemony of the world to its wielder. The name of this lance that King Arthur used to skewer his traitorous son Mordred, piercing through his steel shield. Gungnir? Adam vaulted into the sky and towards Uriel. The Seraph's features twisted into a mask of raw malice, but his attention seemed to be directed at someone else, down below. He raided the steel bolt that had returned back to his hands in its original state and lunged at Adam. Clicking his tongue, the original man wielded his spear with the ferocity of a machine gun, his thrusts assaulting Uriel in volleys. Rather than trying to cover a wide area with swings, he appeared to bet on a single successful thrust to grant him victory. Oh, 
Raziel gave Lilith a solemn nod. Yet he was still taken down by God. Just looking at the battle from the sidelines, with nothing of significance to do, filled me with frustration and shame. I could barely contain myself. I glanced up at the sky, but soon gave up on the idea of confirming her words. <laughs> Sarmi puffed up with pride, and I could definitely agree with her gloating. It was a feat hardly anyone could achieve. Adam and Uriel were currently at a distance that quite exceeded the capabilities of human eyes. I couldn't tell if Uriel tried fleeing or if Adam considered our safety and lured him away. But at this point, a normal man could have, would hardly be able to distinguish their shapes from specks of dust dancing in the air. Those with exceptional powers like Lilith, Raziel, or myself could probably vaguely tell what the specks were doing. But that was about it. We could guess who had had the upper hand, but seeing through a wound sustained prior to the battle was far beyond our capabilities. Gethel's eyes were impressive indeed. Hmm. So that boy too must have been quite formidable indeed. All four of us directed our attention to Sorami. She, her expression distant, observed Adam and Uriel's bout. Her golden eyes saw through everything. Oh. Her eyes saw through the truth of everything, reaching further and further. Listening to those words, for a moment I was overcome by terror. I felt as if her eyes could see through to my very soul. Sormi nodded at the gaping Lilith. So I was right, it is Metatron. Raziel turned pale as a ghost. Whoa! Whoa. As Sormi tried to finish her words, an aberration swept across the sky. A beam of condensed destruction obliterating all and everything in its path, closing in on us at lightning speed. Sormi! I caught Sormi in my arms and tried to escape, but I was too late. The light enveloped me. I could vaguely tell that Lilith and Raziel started towards us, probably hoping to use their magic to protect us. But they too were too late. Exceedingly suddenly, and extraordinarily abruptly, my life came to an end. Okay? I lost consciousness. Fragments of my past flashed before my eyes. A past that was short, that was dense, that was mad. A past I wished to do away with. And so my existence vanished from this world. What?
Lilith rose up with a groan. Raziel jumped to inspect her tablet for possible damage. Adam landed next to Eve, who stood there in a daze. Adam cocked his head to the side. It seemed like Lilith's words succeeded in only puzzling Adam further. Everyone shook their heads in silence. Are we not there? Elith placed her arm on her forehead and let out a groan. An important, precious existence. Uh, okay. So not only were we erased, they also got their memories erased too? The three proceeded to walk away, but Lilith continued to gaze at the sky absentmindedly, trying her best to remember. Her memories dispersed like sand in the wind. She could not recall the name no matter how hard she tried. Was there one more person with them? Two? Three? Was it a man? A woman? An angel? A demon? A human? Something else entirely? No information. Her brain held no record. Blank, blank, blank. <laughs> there was no one to answer Lilith's cry. What the fuck? In the end, the angel did not quite erase my existence. He merely transferred it from the past to the future? Everyone in this world lived in both the past and the present. The moment one took a step forward was the moment his former place had turned to past and his future became his present. Future was a goal, a dream, a hope, and it was despair. But it was not a place for one to occupy. And yet it seemed I was currently precisely there. I stood up and shook my head. Luckily it didn't seem like I was hurt. What on earth happened back there, and where was this place? There was a human-shaped something in front of my eyes. It was a blur, a vague silhouette of someone I... I couldn't make out who it was no matter how hard I squinted my eyes. Someone was calling my name. I, I knew this voice. C calm down, remember. I reached out to the silhouette. My sight betrayed me and I didn't know if I could trust my hearing, so I decided to bet on my sense of touch to confirm my suspicions. My fingers touched the blurry shadow with the girl's voice. The shadow returned to my touch, clinging to me with a teary voice. The glossy texture of her hair at my fingertips, the sweet smell of citrus at my nostrils. Ah, the girl was still in my memories. I didn't remember. I never really forgot. And with that, the shadow took the features of a girl, her face drenched in tears. Sarami couldn't contain her tears. She clung to my arms as if afraid I'd disappear and leave her alone again. Though her worries were unfounded. I would never have left her. Fuck if I know! I didn't know our location, but I could tell one thing. That a bad omen had a vice-like grip on my heart. Oh god. <laughs> Whoa! You, sir, are freaking... Well, um, hmm. Can't figure the right word for this, but... Mecha Phantom of the Opera. Sarmi jumped to her feet. I took a deep breath and turned around to see a man looming before us. I did not notice him approach, nor could I feel his presence. Even seeing him right before my eyes. His appearance was quite peculiar. Crystal lombs, steel torso, silver legs. Only his face gave the impression of a human. And although he seemed more like an artificial construct than a man, the aura surrounding him was that of someone who had transcended everyone and everything, imposing and supreme. 
If God had indeed taken the shape of a human, then I would have imagined him looking something like this man. A seemingly perfect design that allowed for no vagueness or taint. The man closed in on me with a steady step and abruptly took hold of my neck. His strength was immense. Resisting was out of the question. I can only pray he didn't crush my vertebra. Sarmi clutched on the man's arm. A shadow of fear ran across Sarmi's face as she listened to those words, but she soon came back to her senses and continued trying to tear the man's arm away from me, trying to liberate me from his hold. The strength squeezing my throat, unfortunately, did not wane a fraction. He held me with strength precisely calculated to keep me an inch away from death. I would die. If I didn't do anything, he would without a doubt end up crushing my bones, positively killing me. The man's hold did not waver, but I could hear a peculiar tinge of warmth in his tone, even though he kind of denied my very existence. Um, well, see, I have another route, so no. My consciousness dimmed. I finally realized it was this man who launched the all obliterating beam in the last fight. We weren't transported here by chance, it was all according to his will. I tried struggling, gasping for breath, but his impenetrable hold and dismissive words seemed to suck the last remnants of my energy away. He knew everything about me, and with all that information at his disposal, he asserted that there was no race on dare for someone such as myself. And lastly, my brain was telling me plain and clear this man was invincible. There was not a way in hell I could ever defeat him. Victory was impossible. I had no choice but to abandon the hope of putting up a fight with him. <laughs> That's a lie, was what my mouth wanted to try to struggle out. Indeed, was what my heart whispered. He was indeed telling the truth. He knew I never mustered enough will to escape the sidelines. The man's expression changed for the first time, twisting into a mask of contempt. The man whispered it into my ear. I froze, for I knew the meaning of the name, and a grim revelation hit me. Kugutsu Sormi's raison d'air, and her past. I saw it all on a split second. She implored the man, sobs choking out her words. The man gave her a nod and tossed me away. I flew through the air and thought I'd hit the ground like a sack of potatoes, but the impending thud never came. I opened my eyes to a shocking sight. I was outside of Tokyo Battle. I was in the middle of plummeting downward towards the ocean. I tried to fly, but as soon as the notion entered my mind, thorns of harrowing pain dug into my deep into my brain. God damn it, what was going on? How did I fly till now? The headache was so vile I thought I'd split my body apart along with my brain. My mind went blank. I didn't forget how to fly, it's just that my memories of the concept weren't there. Erased. If I hit the water like this, I would no doubt die. Suddenly I realized that an odd sense of relief had intermingled with the fear currently occupying my heart. Did I want to survive? I could not answer even such a simple question. Did I want to survive? Wouldn't it be easier to end everything here? 
I plummeted towards the ocean. The overwhelming might of gravity would doubtlessly crush every single bone in my body. All I had to do was close my eyes and see struggling for the end to come. An unfamiliar face flashed before me for a split second as I closed my eyes. The white-haired girl? Who was that? Sarmi's cry suddenly rang in my mind. Was I hearing things? No, her voice was much too clear, much too vibrant. I was certain it was a cry Sarmi let out seeing my peril. I had no notion of how it could have possibly reached me, but currently I had other, more immediate problems to worry about. Her voice revived my interest in survival. I still didn't know anything about this world or myself. Regardless of what the Steel Man had said, there had to be some sort of reason for my existence in this universe. It didn't exist only because I haven't discovered it yet. I had to survive. Filling my mind with that single thought, I grinded my teeth and endured the splitting headache. I couldn't fly. That man probably pried the knowledge out of my mind. Without memories, I wasn't really in a position to start learning a new concept right now. I doubted any of my inherent powers could help in this situation. I was also quite far from the actual wall of Tokyo Babel, so reaching out to it was also out of the question. So what could I do? My mind wandered to my pocket dimension where the Picati sword had been stored. Though I wasn't in a situation where a blade could... Wait. Right! Manifesting out of thin air, the silver lion let out a piercing growl towards the ever-approaching water. Normally, I'd use it to neutralize the incoming blasts of my foes' magical attacks. In this case, however, I used it on myself. The silver lion gave me a glare and roared at me. I was overcome by a debilitating sensation, as if my body had been shattered to pieces, but it stopped my fall. I even bounced up into the air a little. With the kinetic energy of my fall neutralized, I fell into the water from a much more reasonable 50 meters. Nonetheless, I thought my internal organs would come flying out of my mouth once I finally hit its surface, for all I did was change a fall from a skyscraper into a fall from a 10th floor high apartment building. Still, it saved me from a very gruesome death, so I was quite happy with this outcome. I swam to the surface and glanced up at the sky. I wonder what stratum I fell from. What was up with that white world over there? Who was that man? Was Sarmi alright? I was almost certain she was safe. I doubted that man would want to hurt her. He was more likely to treat her as if she were made of glass. If anything was in danger, it was not her body, but her soul. He might very well take control of her mind or try to erase her memories. I uttered her true identity, the name that the man whispered into my ear. It didn't seem like the man in front of me meant harm. At least he didn't abruptly attack or toss me away like he did to Setsuna. His words, however, hurt me more than any physical action could. He looked straight at me and declared, I made you. And when I asked him what I was, he replied, The future. So, what?! Well, shit! The strength of my legs gave up and I plopped onto the ground. The shock was huge enough to paralyze my body and my mind was clear as a crystal. I felt as if my heart had been sliced into two halves in the blink of an eye by some master swordsman. I was dead, but I had yet to realize it. I mean, it was... What? But wait! And I was pretty good at it. I must have learned it from someone. Arranged me. Thirteenth of the samples. The place the man placed his hand on my cheek. Unable to move, I stared at him. What? Eve? That was my true name. 
仕方ない見せてやろう As the words finally sunk in, my body tensed up from fear. The man pressed two of his fingers against my forehead. That action proved to be enough for me to remember everything. My whole life. Life that was hardly one year long. I was in some si inside some sort of fluid. I had no sense of time, floating in a tank full of oxygen rich liquid. I had my mind filled with various information. The word lived would probably be an exaggeration. I merely existed there. <sighs> the me inside the tank had not a single thought in her mind. She had yet to grow self conscious. Oh, good lord. Her heart was beating, her five cents functional, but she wasn't really alive yet. She was ceaselessly filled with information. Arranged so it could constitute the woman that I currently knew as myself. So that was why I could cook without the need for practice. There was a slight change in the scenery. A girl appeared next to the tank. Ah, she was. <laughs> it appeared I was the 13th person of the future. なんのよ。用がないならここから出て行って。お願い。頭が痛いの。出て行って。出て行って。出て行って。おや。体調不良ですかえ両目をえぐってそこに手を突っ込んで、脳をかきむしりたくなるくらいには体調不良よ。ああ
I nearly let out a chuckle, but contained myself at the last second. I wanted to avoid showing emotion in front of this man. I continued sitting motionless on the ground while the man continued. いずれ君のもとへと馳せ参じる人間たちを導け。Caught up in his ideals already, I don't like this guy. The man's features twisted into a mask of contempt. He was so cruel. He was beyond cruel. Everyone was trying their best to survive, and yet... Fuck off. He took his leave after saying that. I gazed at his back absentmindedly, and even after he disappeared into the distance, I continued to stare at that spot. I wanted to, but couldn't bring myself to cry. I couldn't tell if the revelation was something I should shed tears over. <laughs> Fuck what that guy says, your kugutsu sore me. It appeared my name had now become Eve. I felt sick. No one blessed my birth. There was no family looking for me. I was born just the other day. I was... As my thoughts reached that point, I wrapped my arms around myself and, unable to contain my sobs, started to cry. I trembled at the thought of myself turning to someone else. I shed tears of becoming Eve. I lamented my hollow self. I howled like a little child, howled for Setsuna to save me, and eventually I cried myself hollow. I took the truth in. I was made a little while ago, I was some garbage thing that didn't even have a past. The past I was looking for didn't exist. It was not a thing I ever learned about out of my own volition. Both my body and soul had been designed. Someone of godly powers arranged me so. My world shattered to pieces and returned to dust, and with a heavy creak, so did my heart. I languidly drifted atop the calm sea. The skill to fly in the sky had vanished clean out of my mind. I could remember doing it without difficulty, yet for the life of me, I couldn't remember how. So all I could do now was float. Atop the Sea of Hell, I had already drifted somewhere far away where not even Tokyo Babel remained in sight. I survived somehow, but that was all. Sarmi so safety more or less guaranteed, my mind cooled down enough to ponder, to wander. My thoughts mostly focused on the identity of the mystery man. The mysterious man. First, he couldn't have been human. Everything about him was too otherworldly. That would make him either an angel or a demon. And if I had to pick one, I'd say he was the former. Astaroth Belial Lilith. He didn't mesh well with the image I had formed of demons by now. He was cold and ruthless, like a precise machine. That screamed angel. However, an angel with so much power, not to mention his peculiar shape, would have doubtless been preserved in the annals of history. However, I could not find a single speck of information about such an angel in my database. Unless he was one of those already filed to dead, filed dead, or MIA. MIA. One of the four master angels, perhaps. As part from them, I could only think of Camiel, Raziel, and Sandolphin to have that much power. I shut down my, at this point, idle thoughts. I should probably check Pandora's library before continuing with this riddle. For now, though, I had to find a way to return to Tokyo Battle. <laughs> Something hard pressed against my back and I rose out of the water. The sea's azure gave away for the, from the, for the barrel of scales. I took a breath of relief at the nostalgic touch of solid ground. Men weren't made to float atop the sea like jellyfish. The sense of soothing comfort had abandoned me after the first hour in the water. <laughs> Nanigoto 
殺されずに済んだのだからな東京バベルに追いつけるかうんお前さんを頭に乗せて2時間というところかな I position myself on his head さてそれではもう少し詳しい事情を聞かせてもらおうか天道説だよああ僕たちは I told Leviathan about everything that had transpired. How we reached the third stratum, how Adam fought Uriel, how Uriel seemed to have already been hurt by someone, how an explicable beam flew our way. How we were brought to that world in which apparently only gods were allowed to enter, and how the mysterious man told me Kugutsu sword and he was from the future. I described the man's appearance to the slightest detail, vaguely hoping Leviathan might have an idea who the culprit was. Leviathan jerked his head once. どうも記憶に引っかかりがある。忘れた。いや、違うな。忘れさせられたという方が正解かもしれない。記録にも、記憶にも残らないように。Probably. The Viathan gave me a thoughtful eye. いや、待てよ。ひょっとしたら、記録には残っているのかもしれん。まさか平行世界すべての蔵書から名前を削るわけにもいくまいよいやなかったはずだなかったのではない認識できなかったという方が可能性が高いうん perceive indeed making us unable to perceive his name would merit less trouble than going through every single book we've ever written But that would mean his influence reached up to Camiel and Astaroth, who had forgotten his name just the same. I considered the idea for a moment. The someone I had met deliberately concealed his origins by blocking his name out of our psyches. It also seemed I wasn't his sole victim. His influence reached out to tens of thousands of angels, demons, and humans. Even if it was only to block out a single name, the amount of power needed to achieve that must have been staggering. However, it didn't seem he managed to erase himself completely without trace. As, like Leviathan, if one thought about it, they could soon notice the absence of it, if not remember the actual name itself. A gate with his name behind it had been shut and locked in our minds. But if we recalled the magic word, his name, they'd open and everything would likely return to normal. All I had was to find out who, it was, who he was. With his name and identity in hand, I could instantly pull all the information on the man. And as long as I had reliable data, I could devise a plan to defeat him. Sormi. Tell the truth, I would have loved nothing more than to rush a top Tokyo Babel to meet her right away. But unfortunately, such a feat was currently impossible to me. I didn't know her current location. Still, I knew one thing. If I continued to send in Tokyo Babel, I'd doubtless meet the man again. I clutched onto my chest, thinking if Sormi would make my heart race, disturb its usual rhythm. How is she faring now? Was she facing death? Shivering from fear? I swore to protect her, yet this was where we ended up by the third stratum. I would have blown my head off right here now if I didn't have to save her. Kind of ironic now that I thought about it. I never cared about living or dying. I was ready to face death whenever it came upon me. Yet with Sormi at my side, I gave, on, I gave my everything, struggled to survive. Every cell in my body wished to save her. I cast my regrets aside with his words. I could finally make Tokyo Babel out in the distance. Looking at it like this, I couldn't help but wonder how on earth such a massive object could possibly float on the sea. A giant rhombus of rusted steel languidly drifting in the boundless sea. I should probably best avoid trying to apply the law of conservation of mass to this phenomenon. <laughs> I consulted my memory and found the information right away. It was filled along it was filed alongside my most treasured memories. Yosh.
I didn't need to ask what happened, for I myself spotted someone seemingly waiting for us on the outside of Tokyo Babel, next to the very plate we were heading to. A girl with long, glossy hair and eyes empty of emotion. The way she rose from her sitting position rather than an angel or a demon reminded me of a ghost. I remembered seeing her before. As I was about to call out to her, she suddenly flew into the air. A clump of magical energy built up around her right hand. I didn't need to see her face to tell her she was set on killing me. I jumped backwards. I ran down Leviathan's neck, retreating to his back. The girl landed on Leviathan's head without a hint of her hesitation. Fuck. The girl, not paying Leviathan the slightest attention, lunged towards me. Giving up on inquiring as to her objective, I readied the Sword of the Seven Deadly Sins for battle. And I don't have time to do this. I honestly don't. Okay. We're, it looks like we're going to be having ourselves a bit of a battle on our hands here, but oh my freaking god! Ugh. Okay, first off, whoever that guy is, I hope we kill him. He's an asshole. I don't care what his redeeming thing is, I want to fucking murder him. But... Mm, I was hoping it would just end. I did not expect a sudden battle like this, but... Ugh. Great, 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 fantastic! <sighs> Unfortunately, like I said, that's where I'm gonna have to end it, but, uh... Gah. Well, hopefully we find some more information, because I'm not liking this. I am not liking this one bit, so if you guys like... If you guys like this, be sure to let me know. I And thank you guys so much for... I'm gonna... I'm gonna go to sleep. Ugh.